Hi everyone. Welcome to our worship service this rather cloudy Sunday here in New Brunswick. I thank you all for your prayers and your understanding this week. This has been a pretty long week for us here, but everyone's doing okay with some mending on the way. Our scripture passage this week is taken from Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 22. It says the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the Praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, hail King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. May God bless our reading of his holy word. During Lent, we come face to face with the cross, the cross that Christ died upon to save us from our sins. I preach about it, we read scripture about it, we sing hymns that talk about it. And in the text that I just read, Jesus exhausted and weakened by the beatings he endured, collapsed under its weight on the way to Golgotha. The Roman soldier in charge looks around at the crowd and sees a strong bodied Simon standing as a spectator to Jesus' suffering. The soldier with the law on his side orders Simon of Serene to pick up the cross and to carry it. No choice is offered, no fee is paid. It is a pure and simple case of conscription, taking this cross and carry it. There were no ifs, no ands or buts. It was just do it. It doesn't take much thinking to conclude that most of the crosses that you and I bear today come about in the same way. Not necessarily by a soldier ordering us, but because of life circumstances. There you were, one moment, carefree, going about your day-to-day -day business, and then came a heart attack, or a stroke, or a car accident. At work, it was like a simple change maybe, a new boss who replaced your old boss, and maybe the new boss is a horror to work for. Take a marriage where one partner is faithful and hard work and the other runs around and is addicted to some bad habits. It could be something as simple as a child who never seems to listen to a mother-in-law who must always have the last word. One thing is obvious to you. You have a cross to bear, not of your doing, or liking, and not with any end in sight. At least Simon of Serene knew that when he got to the top of the hill, this cross was leaving his shoulders. But I want you to think for a minute about Job. Oh, Job, remember, good and righteous Job, struck down by the loss of his children, his wealth, his physical health, week after week and month after month, sits in agony, with his boils, <coughs> surrounded by a broken home and uncomforting friends. We know what eventually happens to Job, but what will eventually happen to us and the crosses that we must bear? <coughs> Some people are quiet and resigned to the fact. Others are constantly complaining. Simon never said a word. He just picked up the cross and he carried it. But Job's suffering was much longer and more painful. <coughs> oh, excuse me. He did not hesitate to voice his complaints and to question why he got something that he didn't think he deserved. During the seasonal Lent, as we face the cross, Look for a moment at what the church has done with the cross. We've stuck it in altars, stained glass windows. 
We've put it in hymns and prayers and creeds. <clears throat> it has people wearing it as a religious symbol, just like I have here. <clears throat> the church took this awful, ugly, brutal instrument of shame and death and dedicated it to God. But the Bible says, Lord, what happened on the cross was your work and design done to save us. And so we sing, in the cross of Christ I glory, when I survey the wondrous cross, beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Now in Mark eight thirty four, Jesus said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. From what Jesus said, it is clear that he assumed that you and I would have a cross to bear. And there are three commands given in that one scripture verse. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. These three all go together. You can't have one without the other two and still be on the path to the kingdom of God. According to what Jesus commands, it's the person who doesn't think she or he has a cross to bear that ought to be concerned. If everything is just hunky-dory in your life and you don't have a care in the world, you are either off the mark and if you are walking with Christ, you know that you're carrying a cross of some sort. I mentioned earlier that the church took the cross and dedicated it to God. How do you know and how do you do that with a spouse who has Alzheimer's and no longer knows who you are? Or a child who is slowly dying with a rare blood disease? Or a family member who just rubs you the wrong way? But you must live with it. How do I take that cross that I bear, and usually there is more than one at a time, and dedicate it to God? The answer on how is given in the two other commands that Jesus gave in following him. Whosoever come after me, let him deny himself. You see, self-denial is a must if our cross is going to be dedicated to God. Otherwise, we're going to complain and look for sympathy. The reason we call our burden a cross is because there is pain or suffering or hardship that comes to us from it. Many people practice self-denial, but it is not self-denial for the will of God. Like the husband who keeps having pains in his chest from time to time and just ignores them. And his wife says, well, you ought to go to the doctor and get that checked. And he says, oh, it's nothing, probably just a little indigestion, nothing that some tums won't fix. That's self-denial. But there's no passion for God involved in that. Or take the school situation where a bully picks on a younger student, forcing him to give up his lunch money each day. And, told, and this young person is told to keep their mouth shut for fear of reprisals. Self-denial, all right but neither student has any knowledge of God. We know a lot about self-denial, just by the fact that we may not have enough money, we will deny ourselves that new dress or that new car or whatever it is that we really want, but we know we can't have. So when Jesus says, whosoever would come after me, let him deny himself, that should neither sound strange or unusual to us. We do that a lot already, but not because we want to love God or honor God. That was what Jesus meant. Denying yourself something or someone because the Lord has given me this cross to bear for his glory. If we can get all this self-denial stuffed, we do ch channeled in God's direction instead of our own direction then we would have learned how to dedicate this cross to God. Now take, for example, the elderly husband who is bedridden at home with a severe case of Parkinson's and kidney failure. Now, the role of the wife is now more of a nurse than a wife. Every day she practices self-denial, other things that she would like to be doing and having. Instead, she is caring for him. 
What is her attitude or understanding toward this cross she bears? Now, if the wife is a Christian trying to follow the will of God, then her heart is what Romans 28 says, as we know all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. That's a verse that's in her heart and her mind when she's thinking her situation over. And she says, God, I'm not sure why my husband is in this condition, but as long as I am able and believe it is that, it is your will that I will carry for, care for him. Should she complain? But she knows that would grieve the Holy Spirit. Because all things work together for good when you are his called and his chosen children. And what pity does she need when she's convinced that this is God's will for her life at this moment? There is one other command that she has yet to obey. And remember, there were three. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. She has certainly denied herself and with God's will in mind, and she has certainly taken up the cross each day as she cares for her ailing husband. Now she might think that alone is enough to demonstrate her walk with the Lord. But you and I know how easily fears and doubts come in at night. You and I know that when we are tired from a long day's task, our weakened bodies can easily slip into the why me, will this ever end? Following Jesus means more than self-denial, even for the right reasons, more than just taking up the cross. Following Jesus means keeping my personal relationship with him intact through prayer, Bible study, worship, meditation, and the like. Even the best of saints could not go on bearing their cross for Christ without private devotional time and worship. They would suffer from burnout, fear, or discouragement. Now, do you think Sister Teresa could do all that she did when she was alive without beginning the day with prayer and worship? Do you think Jesus could have reached Golgotha without having spent so much time in prayer with the Father beforehand? Following Jesus means being yoked, hooked up with Jesus, like a two-person team pulling the load together, sharing the burden of the cross together. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your burdens on the Lord and he shall sustain you. When we daily pray and worship, study and meditate on the word, we bring ourselves in whatever state we are into, in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And it should not surprise us to find strength to go on for another day of peace in the midst of our unhappy or unwanted circumstances. I wonder if we would follow Jesus, get close with him, if we did not have a cross to bear. I wonder if we would follow Jesus if we thought there was another way. Some may perhaps for the sake of safety or success, but when we finally get it right, if only for a few moments, like that time that Simon of Cyrene walked up the hill to Golgotha, carrying the cross for Christ, did he and do we not share in such a time of cross-bearing a genuine love with the master? What some have called a foretaste of heaven yet to come. Yes, it is Lent. And yes, we all have our crosses to bear, not just in this season, but in all the seasons of our lives. Each one of us, no one escapes having a cross to bear, some more so than others. And yeah, I know there's times that we wonder, why me? But I hope that you remember that God calls us to deny ourselves to take up the cross that we are bearing and to follow him. We are never any closer to God than we are when we understand these things and we let go and we lean on the master. 
we just have to heed to our Lord's commands. Let's pray. Lord God, there are so many challenges that we deal with in our lives, our daily lives. There are so many crosses that we seem to have to pick up and carry. And some we're piling one on after the other. And some, God, we ask the questions because in our humanness, we don't seem that we can bear them. But God, you know our strength. And in our weakness, you are our strength. So Lord, we just ask that as we pick up our crosses, as we sort out the many things that we have to deal with in this lifetime, that we will never leave you out of the equation, that we will deny ourselves, that we will take up the cross, that we will focus on you. Lord, help us to better serve the people that you've called us to serve in everything that we do in our lives. Amen. I thank you so much for your continued prayers for our situation. Um, and I will see you again this time next week. In the meantime, as you go, may you make much of Jesus. Amen.